Hello friends, welcome to Thrabian Sabbath School panel. We are on lesson number three in the study of the book of John. It is an exciting study and it is a study that really is elevating. It brings our thoughts to God's throne Amen. of grace. We get a marvelous picture of Jesus Christ and we encourage you to behold Jesus during this uh, lesson that we're studying and throughout the whole quarterly. The title for this lesson is uh, The Backstory, The Prologue, lesson number three in this study. And I'd like to introduce the three Avian Sabbath School panel family that are with us today. Sister Shelley Quinn to my left. Thank you, Johnny. I have Monday's lesson, which is The Word Made Flesh. Thank you. And we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, John. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled Hearing or Not Hearing the Word. <laughs> Amen. We're, we're looking forward to hearing that. <laughs> we have Sister Gio Morricone. Welcome. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. On Wednesday, we look at reappearing themes, belief and unbelief. And on the other end, Professor Daniel Perrin. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, on Thursday, we finish off with reappearing themes, glory. Amen. Thank you very much. And this study, of course, we need the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask uh, Professor uh, Perrin, if you'll please pray for us. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we place ourselves in your hands to be led by you, molded by you, fashioned by you, and restored by you. And to do that, Lord, we come to your word, starting here in the first chapter of the book of John. We just ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit mm -hmm. as we teach, as we study, as we learn, and then to go out and apply and put into practice everything that you shared with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 One of the marvelous things about studying God's Word is that the Lord opens our eyes to learn new things. Mm -hmm. But as we seek the Lord to learn new things, He also, in His marvelous way, also teaches us through other fellow believers. And this is one of the great things about the 3 Sabbath School panel. Again, uh, we want to let you know about the lesson uh, preparation that we do, for example, our lesson notes, we'd like to make them available to you. And to get those, we encourage you to visit 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and you'll see a tab that lets you know that you can select that to be able to set, uh, set, set up to get them every week. Mm -hmm. And you will get our notes to continue studying uh, so that you can enhance your understanding of God's Word. And so uh, please consider that. We are now, as I said, in lesson number three. And in lesson number three, uh, this week's lesson, we're gonna look at John chapter one, verses one through five, Genesis chapter one, verse one, briefly. Uh, John chapter one, verses nine through 13. John chapter three, verses 16 through 21. John chapter nine, 35 through 41. Matthew chapter seven, verses 21 to 23. And John chapter 17, verses one through five. We will try by God's grace to get through all of those. The memory text, marvelous. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In uh, lesson, week one, actually, week one of this uh, quarterly, uh, we took a look at the things that are about the whole book of John. Uh, which explain why he wrote this gospel. And I'm going to read those texts in a, in a moment. This week's lesson returns to the beginning of the gospel, where John sets forth the direction that he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, intends to take the reader. That's you and I. And so let's begin in Sunday's portion of the lesson. And before it's entitled, In the Beginning, the Divine Logos. I go back now to... John chapter 20, verses 31, uh, 30 and 31, actually, to get uh, an understanding of why did John write this gospel? What was his intention? In other words, let's say God's intention through John to bring to us. It says in John 20, verses 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Please understand that it must have been a difficult thing for John to select. What am I going to, what am I going to write? But under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we have the book 
or the Gospel according to John. My part begins with John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I will read all the t text and we're going to back up and start looking at it a little bit closer. In the beginning was the Word, hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Here in John chapter 1, verse 1, we are taken, it says, in the beginning. Well, the beginning of what? It said the beginning of creation. The beginning of what exactly? Uh, it doesn't tell us when the beginning was, but the way it is uh, phrased, it brings us back to really the Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in the beginning was the Word, takes us even back further than that to a time when there is no identifiable beginning, identifiable beginning, that you can keep going and keep going, trying to find the beginning, but you cannot find it because it's in the eternity past. Hmm. Now in, in uh, Gen uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, chapter 1, Chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, it uses the word was three times. And in these three times, he's talking about a continuous time in the past that has no identifiable beginning, no set point. We each can tell you, oh, I was born uh, July 20, 1959. I was born June 13, uh, 1964. Whatever the case may be, we can identify our beginning. And for that reason, we have a birth certificate. And, but... According to the scriptures, Jesus Christ has no beginning date. So let's go into the lesson as we look at the word, the word. In the beginning was the word. This is a Greek word, logos, and some have suggested that um, perhaps it doesn't really help us in fully understanding about Jesus when you use the word, the word, because you get the Greek word logos, which is uh, something said, a thought, and by implication, a topic, or a word, or a thing uttered. So it is a, a, a complex word, if I can say, the word logos to translate into the, a language. For example, in Spanish, we don't use the word word for logos. We use the word in the beginning was the verb, which is a very interesting mm. difference in the two. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is the word logos, and you're going to hear more about that as we continue. Now, the next part of John chapter 1, verse 1 takes us, was with God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. This, wa this word was is a Greek word that implies a close, intimate relationship between the word and God, God the Father. So there's this intimate connection, this intimate relationship between the word and God. And so... I move on to, and the Word was God. Oh, this, this is a deep, deep thought. And I'm going to read to you from the lesson because this <coughs> takes us into the Greek. And uh, in order for me to say less words, I'm going to read it for the lesson. Uh, it, the lesson says, and then he says, and the Word was God. But how can the Word be with God and at the same time be God? Mm. The answer is found in the Greek. Greek has a definite article, the, T-H-E, but no indefinite article, the word a or the word an. What's important for us then is that the Greek definite article, the, points to particularly, particularity, some particular object or person. Now, the way this was phrased by John, the Apostle John, it was uh, made with such exactness, such carefully selected words so that there could be no mistake in what he is trying to say. And by the way, uh, there is no variance in the different manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. They all say the same thing. So you cannot argue, oh, wait a minute, this one says that, this one says that. No, they all are there exactly as we have it in the King James Version. And so... Take a look, for example, at 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. It says, And we have known and believed 
the love that God has for us. God is love. Mm -hmm. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. There, in, in this verse, again, there's a carefully constructed phrase, God is love. It's the same thing that we can look at in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, the Word was God. You cannot say that God was the Word. You have to say it as it is written. The Word was God. Just like here, you cannot say love is God. You must say God is love. I hope you follow me on that. So there is in this Greek expression, this, uh, this exactness in the, in the words that were carefully, carefully selected. Now, let's go ahead, uh, because of time, I have to rush here to uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Uh, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And when we go to John chapter 1 verse 2, it prepares us for John chapter 1 verse 3. Hmm. Notice what it says in John chapter 1 verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. It's almost like a repetition of John chapter 1, verse 1. The Word was God. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So it says He was in the beginning with God, talking about Jesus Christ. He's preparing us for John chapter 1, verse 3. Notice what it says. All things mm -hmm. were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Some people have the idea that Jesus... Christ was a created being. It cannot be so. This is so clearly stated mm -hmm. that there can be no mistake in saying that he, he created all things and He is before all things and without Him nothing can exist. So He is before all things. And it's interesting that some have taken the idea to say in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Some have taken and added an article that is not in the Greek, and it is uh, scholars have looked at this and say there is no A to say A God. And this is a mistake to do this. It is very clear in the Greek, and this is one of the places in the Scriptures where the divinity of Jesus Christ is so yeah. clearly stated. Amen, amen. Thank you, Johnny. I am going to be repeating some of this. We learn through repetition, but that's good. You know, the Savior was identified by the title Messiah in the, oh, in the Hebrew and the Christ in Greek. Both of those are titled that mean the anointed one. Now, he was also identified by the name Jesus, the name that was given to him, not then, but when he came to earth. John starts the gospel with neither, neither the title nor the name, but he calls Jesus the Word. So let's read that again. John 1.1. 1, 1. I love this beginning. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. In the original Greek, there's two terms that are translated word. One is logos, and then the other is rhema. There's eight scriptures in the New Testament that talk about the rhema word. This would be like receiving an instruction from Jesus any, or from the word and putting it into action. That's when it's rhema, but in Various Greek philosophers use the word lagos to refer to the idea of logic or reason, but it was more ethereal and abstract. For John, the revelation of all truth is the lagos, the Word of God. He is the complete summation of all truth, wisdom, and the will of God. For John, Jesus is the complete revelation of God's love. 
the complete revelation of his salvation plan. For John, the Lagos was a person. John 1 and verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Jesus is the eternal God without beginning or end. The eternal God who hears and speaks and interacts with his people. Jesus is the creator God who spoke all things into existence. The Word of God, who was God, who spoke all things into existence by the power of His Word. I want to return again to Colossians chapter 1, and I want to focus on verse 15. We'll read the whole thing, but we're going to come back and focus on 15. Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now somebody's going, aha, he was born. It says, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things can or consist. We have to understand Firstborn in Scripture can refer to the order of birth. But when you're reading covenant language, firstborn in Scripture means to hold a position of preeminence. So we look at Exodus 4 and verse 22, and here's what God is telling Moses to go tell Pharaoh. Exodus 4, 22 and 23. You shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel, he's talking about the 12 tribes, the newly formed, or, or the, the 12 tribes that are going to become the newly formed nation of Israel. Israel is my son. This is covenant language. My firstborn. This is covenant language. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve him. The Lord called Israel firstborn. They weren't the first nation, but the Lord designated the nation as his firstborn covenant son, the son of the everlasting covenant, ranking them first in covenant relationship, giving them preeminence firstborn. John 1, 14, we're returning back to uh, John now. So when it says Jesus is the firstborn, he holds preeminence because he's the creator of all. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth the eternal second person of the Godhead, humbled himself mm -hmm. to take on our flesh. The second person of the Godhead, by becoming one of us, entered at our time and our space mm -hmm. to redeem us, to set us free from the bondage of sin. He dwelt among us. That means literally, to pitch his tent among us, and it alludes back to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, where God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The sanctuary, this idea of pitching this tent, it was a tent structure. So let's break this down. Jesus is the divine covenant son of God. He's stepped into human flesh, veiling his glory so that the people could come in contact with him. But he had to become a human and live an unblemished, spotless life so that he could be our substitute, that he would stand in and sacrifice his life to pay the penalty for our sins. Let's quickly look at Philippians 2, 6 through 8. 
Paul writes, and this is one of my favorite passages, who, talking of Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, because he was, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. The eternal God, the second person of the Godhead, pledged himself before our world was ever created to be the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, Revelation 13, 8. He is the only begotten, it says. That's a covenant term. Begotten in scripture can refer to being sired, but in covenant language, begotten means chosen for a covenant purpose. Let me give you an example. Deuteronomy 32, 18, Moses told Israel, of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful. You have forgotten the God who fathered you. Mm. So they were his covenant son. They were begotten by God, chosen by God, and God was considered their father. Now, if you turn your Bibles to Hebrews 11, we'll begin with verse 17. This is the faith chapter. Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten son, meaning he is a unique, one of a kind son of promise who is the rightful heir to the covenant blessings. We know that Ishmael was born before Isaac. He was Abraham's son. But look at Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. What does that mean? The only begotten son is the unique covenant son of the, one of a kind, son of promise, through whom covenant blessings will be passed on. He's the rightful heir. And he said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. And here's what, here's what Abraham, his thought process. He concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. See, Abraham saw Christ's day. He knew what was going to happen. He saw the ram in the thicket. Now, some mistakenly think, and you alluded to this, John, I have to do this quickly, that Jesus was issued forth from the bosom of the Father, perceiving him as being inferior to the Father. That's misguided. It's based on a single scripture, John 1, 18, that says, the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father. It simply means in the bosom is the eternal union of love, mm -hmm. this deep intimacy that exists between Jesus Christ as person and the Father in heaven. So final thought, Colossians 2, 9, we know, Paul said, in him, in Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Shelley. Well, friends, we're going to be back in just a moment. Hello, I'm Greg Morconi, and I'm so glad you've joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. Larnetta was recovering from spine surgery when she found 3ABN. It was one of two stations she could pick up over the air after shutting off her cable TV. Then one day she heard Curtis and Paula Aikens on 3ABN's Abundant Living Health program, and she was hooked. Larnetta watched for several years until she heard them mention a Healthy Heart Conference they would be presenting in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, so she registered for it and began saving money for her trip. But a week before the conference, she realized she wouldn't be able to afford it, so she canceled. Not long after, her phone began to ring. It was Curtis, and he was asking her why she wasn't coming. And when she told him she couldn't afford it, he offered to pay for her hotel and transportation. At that two-day conference, each participant received a folder with heart health information along with a Bible study guide. Then she met someone who was willing to help her go through all the other Bible study guides by correspondence. But Curtis felt impressed to help Larnetta himself. And as she says, it wasn't long before she had a Bible question every day. 
Not only did he answer them, he backed his answers with scripture. Meanwhile, Paula spent many hours on the phone discussing life and health questions with her. What was the result? We'll find out on the next 3ABN Mission Moment. God bless you in a special way today. Welcome back. We continue in this study of the back story, the prologue, and we continue with Pastor James Rafferty. Thank you, John. I'm in uh, Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled Hearing or Not Hearing the Word. And we're going to be focusing on John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, and a harsh reality that John depicts here about how people respond to Jesus. So let's just take a look at these verses, John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. It says, verse 9, that was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Talk about that a little bit. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Hmm. He came into his own and his own received him not. But, verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the prologue to John uh, verses 1 through 18, the quarterly goes on to say, describes not only who Jesus Christ the Word is, but also how people would relate to him. In John 1, 9, he is called the true light, who enlightens every person coming into the world. That light illumines the world, making it understandable. As C.S. Lewis puts it, continuing to read the quarterly here, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. I love that. Jesus is real because we not only see Him, the Logos, but by Him, we see everything else. Everything else comes into focus as we get our eyes on Jesus Christ. We see the reality of life, why we were created, what our purpose was, the whole plan of salvation, what God's eternal purpose for the human race really is. We see all of that in Jesus Christ. So also, look at the implications of John 1.9. Look at what it's saying, the quarterly goes on to say. Light comes to everyone, but not everyone welcomes the light. As we will see in tomorrow's study, a major theme in the Gospel of John is how people receive or reject Jesus. The theme begins here. So the sad litany is that the Messiah came to his own people, the people of Israel, and many did not receive him as the Messiah. In Romans 9 through 11, those are the chapters, Paul deals with this same tragic theme that many of the Jews have rejected Jesus, but Paul doesn't end on a negative note, and neither should we. He says, in fact, that many Jews with Gentiles will accept Jesus as their Messiah. Indeed, he warns the Gentiles, don't boast against the Jews, for if you were cut off and put into this, out of a wild olive tree and put into this, grafted into this uh, tree contrary to nature, into this cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? And that's in Romans chapter 11, verse 24. So the quarterly goes on to say, in a similar vein, John says that all who do receive Jesus as their Savior will become the children of God, and this happens by believing in His name. And that's one of the themes that we find here in John 1, going all the way through to the very end of the book, this whole idea of believing in Jesus. In fact, John never uses the word faith in his gospel. Instead of the word faith, he uses the word belief. Mm -hmm. And they're synonymous when you compare because Matthew, Luke, and Mark and Luke all use the word faith heavily, and yet John never uses it because he's he's using the word belief in the place of faith. When you look up those two words, you're going to find Mm -hmm. that they're leading to the same meaning, basically. God wants us to believe, to, to have the faith of Jesus Christ. So, Here's the connection according to the quarterly, John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 connects with John chapter 20 and verse 31. Here's the connection between the prologue and the conclusion. The whole purpose now of the book of John is to get us to believe in Jesus Christ. And in believing in Jesus Christ, we really are believing in the Word, believing in the light that God has given us. That's why John chapter 1 begins with this introduction that Jesus Christ is the Word. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and enlightened us. So John 1 verse 9 talks about how that Jesus enlightens us. We're in darkness about God's character. We're in darkness about life. We're in darkness about our purpose. We're in darkness about what's going on around us, and the Bible enlightens us. And then in verse 12, it says, He also empowers us. Right. We've got the word in the King James that those who receive him get power or in the New King James and other versions, the right. We have the right to become the children of God, the sons of God. So he empowers us. And then you've got another verse, verse 14. We didn't touch on that verse. Uh, I think Daniel and and, uh, maybe Jill are going to touch on that. I know Daniel is. But just one phrase there that I want us to look at in John 1, verse 14. It says that when he comes, he comes full of grace and truth. And when you think about grace and truth, sometimes you can think about those as opposites. You know, you've either got grace on the one side, we'll call this side the grace, or you've got truth on the other side. This is the truth over here, right? Um, But rarely do you see this balance. I'm just going to throw this out here, this balance of grace and truth. You know, people can be either into the truth or into grace. I ask people all the time, I say, when you think about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I I ask Adventists this, when you think about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what word in your mind best depicts the Adventist Church, the word grace or the word truth? Probably truth, mostly. Truth, and the evangelicals, they got the grace community churches down the road, but if you want truth, you come to the Adventist Church. That's where the truth is, right? But in Jesus, and of course we're Christians, we're followers of Christ, in Jesus, you couldn't say that he was uh, mostly described as truth or mostly described as grace. They were balanced in Christ. When you looked at Christ, you saw grace, Mm -hmm. and when you look at Christ, you see truth. And you're going to find this is a major theme through the whole of the Gospel of John. In every chapter, for example, uh, and I know Jill's going to touch on this, but in John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Christ and, and, and Jesus says, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how's that work? And he says, you don't know how that works? That's truth. That's truth, right? right? But then in the very same chapter, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten mm-hmm. son. And God didn't come to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. That's grace. And as you move through the book of John, you're going to find this happening again and again. He says to the woman at the well, you've had five husbands and the guy you're living with now is not your husband, but I have the water of life. And if you take this water, you'll never thirst again. You see this blend that takes place. And so God wants to enlighten us. Mm -hmm. God wants to give us this power to become his children. And he wants to balance us out. When we fell, we became imbalanced and we are by nature imbalanced. We tend to go to one extreme or the other. And often when we're searching for the truth, one of the ways that we can identify it is by looking for the two extremes. Isaiah 30, 21 says, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the left or when you turn to the right. And that voice is the word of God, the word of God that comes to us. And of course, in the days of Christ, the nation of Israel were God's people and the word of God came to the people and the people didn't receive the word of God. And we might look back now and say, ah, I can't believe they didn't receive Jesus. You know, how can people not receive Jesus? He's full of grace and truth. And yet there's many Christians today, the word of God comes to them and tells them, hey, the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Hey, when you die, you don't go directly to heaven or hell. You know, you're you're in, hey, you know, there's this prophecy that talks about the mark and we don't receive it. And yet we look at the Jews and we say, well, how could they not receive the word of God? And maybe we're doing the same thing today with the word of God. And then, of course, to Seventh-day Adventists, the word of God comes to us. Maybe it comes to us more in the testimony of Jesus. Have you heard of the testimony of Jesus, right? In Revelation 12, 17, we're pointed to a remnant church who keeps the testimony of Jesus, which is identified in Revelation 19, 10 as the spirit of prophecy. So maybe Jesus comes to us with this light of the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy, and we don't receive that. Each one of us has our test. The Jews had the test of Jesus himself, the word made flesh. And then of course, our evangelical brothers and sisters, Jesus comes to them. A lot of the truth that the Jews hold on to, We don't hold on to that. That Old Testament was for them. It's not for us. No, all of the light that God has given is for all of us to embrace. And then, of course, we've got this remnant church and they've been given even more light. We call it the lesser light. And perhaps there's some things in there that we don't, well, no, I'm not sure if that's as, you know, as important as other. Every piece of light that God has given us is important. Later in in the stories uh, of, of of the Gospel of John, we're told about 
uh, picking up all the fragments of light. Just because we've got a full belly, just because God has given us all this truth, doesn't mean we shouldn't pick up those fragments and keep those because we need every bit, every particle of light that God has given us. So we want to read these verses in John chapter one in a way that applies them to ourselves today, not just to the Jews of old, not just to other denominations, is the light coming to us? Are we receiving the light and allowing it to empower us because the power is in the Word of God, allowing that to us, uh, it to balance us so that we don't go to one extreme or the other extreme? This is the question each one of us needs to ask as we ponder these beautiful truths in the Gospel of John. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. Balanced presentation, praise the Lord, about balance. And Shelley and Pastor Johnny, thank you. On Wednesday, I'm Jill Morricone. We look at reappearing themes, belief and unbelief. And as Pastor James brought out, we kind of build on this theme. There's two groups in John's gospel, those who receive the light, those who reject the light, those who believe in Jesus and accept him as their Messiah, those who have opportunity to believe and yet they refuse him. We see two groups, those who receive, those who reject, those who believe, those who have unbelief. The difference is not in Jesus. The difference is how people respond to Jesus. Over and over again in John's Gospel, we discover that believers turn toward Jesus, even when he confronts them, even when he rebukes them, they still turn toward Jesus. We see this with Nicodemus in John mm -hmm. chapter three, him turning toward the light. We see this with the disciples. We see this with the woman at the well in John chapter four. We see this with the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter five. We see this with a woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight, with a man who's born blind in John chapter nine, and even Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, they all turn toward Jesus. By contrast, the unbelievers fight against Jesus and they fight against truth. We see this with the scribes and Pharisees all throughout the book of John, refusing the light, turning against Jesus. We see this, we talked, I think it was the last week about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. We see that in John chapter six, but how did the multitude, um, how did they respond to Jesus at the very end? In John 6, 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. You see, they rejected. They turned away from Jesus. But what was the response of the disciples? Jesus said to the 12, are you also going to leave? Will you also go away? Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So there we see the contrast. The multitude walked away. They turned their back. They refused the light. They rejected Jesus. But the disciples, even though they still didn't have everything right and there still might've been some hurt and confusion, they turned toward Jesus. Mm -hmm. We see Judas, notably one of the 12 disciples who in the end, turned away from Jesus. Mm. Now, Pastor James referenced this with the name um, faith and belief. Mm. Um, in the Gospel of John, the word pistis, which just means faith, belief, that noun is actually not found in the Gospel of John. And you say, wait a minute, I thought belief was all through the Gospel of John. Didn't Pastor James just say belief was in there? The verb form is found there. Mm -hmm. So the verb is found all throughout the Gospel of John. In fact, it's found 98 times in the Gospel of John. This verb form of pistis, but it's the verb form. Act actively believe. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, it's only found 244 times. So 98 of those times is in the Gospel of John. This means belief was super important as John wrote his Gospel, understanding that importance. So let's go to John chapter three. Turn with me to John three. If we get to it, we're gonna look at three snapshots of belief and unbelief, three snapshots of receiving or rejecting. We're gonna look at John 3, John 6, and John 12. I don't know if we'll get to it all, but you can get the notes if we don't cover everything. In John 3, I call this the call to faith in salvation, or in John 3, 16. And what we discover, we often end it at verse 16. We don't keep reading. 
And what we discover is that every call to faith actually brings judgment with it. In other words, if you don't receive, you're going to reject and you will receive that judgment or condemnation. What we learn from this is there's only two camps and we cannot be casual about the gospel. John 3, 16, this is the call to faith and salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We discover that God the Father loves us as well. It's not just Jesus coming, God sent Jesus. Jesus came for the purpose of salvation. Eternal life is a gift. But keep reading hey, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the condemnation that light, this is Jesus, has come into the world. And yet men loved darkness mm -hmm. rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And here we find some reasons why people reject the light, while they fall not in the category of those who receive and believe, but those who reject in unbelief. Sometimes we reject the light because we naturally love sin because we're afraid to come into the light and reveal the sin in our hearts, not wanting Jesus to change us. Jump down to verse 21. He who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. You see, following Jesus requires acknowledgement of our sin, bringing my mess to the light, as it were, turning toward Jesus in my sin and allowing him to expose the sin in my heart and then allowing him to change it and transform it, forgive it, and then change and transform me. So don't be afraid to bring your junk to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus did that, did he not? He did the right thing. He dwelt in spiritual darkness, even though he was a teacher in Israel, he was still in spiritual darkness. He needed conversion, but he turned toward the light, even though he fussed at the beginning and said, I'm not sure about this, but he did. He made a decision to turn toward the light. He moved from darkness to light. Mm -hmm. By contrast, Judas moved from light to darkness. Mm -hmm. We see this in John 13, verse 30. This is, of course, the Last Supper. Judas, having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and what does the Bible say? It was night. Mm -hmm. He went at that point from light mm -hmm. to darkness. He chose deliberately, turn his back on Jesus, and he would not receive the light, but he rejected it. Let's look at John 9. We're going to John 9, and for this, I see the call to make a decision. The first snapshot was the call to faith and salvation. This is the call to make a decision. This is, of course, the man who was born blind. We studied this on a previous week. And he is healed, and the Pharisees are not very happy about him being healed. The man received sight, did he not? And he would not deny Jesus. He received Jesus. He went toward the light. The Pharisees, the spiritual leaders, could not even see. Or in John 9, 35, Jesus heard they cast him out. And when he had found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? See, he's eager to accept and receive the light. And Jesus said, you've both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. I love this. Instantly, he accepts Jesus' words by faith, at face value. He turns to the light, as it were, and chooses to believe. Keep reading in verse 39, John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world, that those who do not see may see. Those who see may be made blind. Mm. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said, are we blind also? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. From this I learn that hypocrisy is deadly and unbelief is really inexcusable. They claimed a spiritual light. Were they hypocrites, the scribes and Pharisees? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They claimed spiritual light and they didn't even see the need for their own conversion. They didn't even recognize that they needed the light. They stood in judgment on Jesus, the light. 
rather than letting his light come in and measure and judge them. Those blinded by sin can be enlightened. While those who do not feel the need for light, they move into deeper darkness. Our final snapshot is in John chapter 12. We won't read it all, but John chapter 12 is this other analogy of light in darkness. And it's a call for you and I to follow Jesus even over the praise of men. In verse 42, it says, even the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. As you and I make decisions every day to receive or reject, for light or darkness, for belief or unbelief. Don't let the opinions of other people make you reject the light. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill, and each one of you. This is a rewarding study in the book of John that I know I'm appreciating. And my name is Daniel Perrin. I have Thursday's lesson, which is called Reappearing Themes, Glory. Now, the glory of God is not confined to one place in the Bible. So this study takes us all over the Holy Scriptures and it was kind of hard to deter determine which text to use and which ones to leave for later. But that word glory, it's the Greek word here, doxa. Glory and doxazo is to glorify. Now looking at the definition, there's a variety of words. You have opinion, judgment, view, each one of these as a determination of value. And then you have, a, as a part of the definition, splendor and brightness and majesty. This is the pinnacle of value, just the overwhelming brightness and splendor of the thing of greatest value. And also as a part of the definition or usage, you have value and, and honor leading to worship and praise. And uh, we, we, we uh, look at the word glory and we tend to apply it to physical things, but there's something much deeper than just brightness and splendor and what we think of as majesty. And we see this in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, where Jeremiah says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, or the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. True glory revolves around the character rightly understood, the character of God. So in the Bible, the word glory is paired with things like this, God's law on tables of stone, glory, his hand, God's right arm, God's name, God's kingdom, God's church, his gospel, his power, all of these are associated with the word glory. Jesus appearing is glorious. Jesus resurrected body. All of these turning our attention once again to something beautiful and precious that is beyond us. Even in the Bible where glory is used of humans, it's very clear that God's glory is on a totally different level. So a brief background look at the glory of God in the Old Testament prepares us for what we see in John. I'll just take you on a few wonderful texts here like Exodus 24, 17. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so it's unapproachable. God's glory is unapproachable by sinful humans in our, our own sinfulness. Exodus 40, 35, Moses couldn't even enter the tabernacle because the glory of the Lord filled it. Same thing in 2 Chronicles 7, 2. The priests could not enter the, the temple because the glory of the Lord filled it. Ezekiel 10, verse 4. The glory of the Lord is, is described as brightness. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 2, verse 10. The glory of the Lord, and all through that chapter, God's glory is majesty. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Glory, God's glory is exclusive to him. It's not owned by any other God, anything that claims power. And then a final text here from the Old Testament, Exodus 33, 18 and 19. And I love this text as, as I know you do as well. And he said, this is Moses, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Mm -hmm. 
Here you have this equality equation. My glory is my goodness. It is my character of compassion and mercy that comes by my choice, not because you earn it, you deserve it, you demand it, but because I choose to love you. Mm. And so with those things in the background here, we get right into the book of John, chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, mm. the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The lesson points out that there are two storylines in the book of John, the divine or cosmic storyline that intertwines with the human storyline that we're a part of. And God's glory is actually seen, beheld, witnessed, all of that glory of God in the incarnation in Jesus who becomes flesh and becomes one of us. And the incarnation then leads us to more and more into a greater understanding of God's glory. Let's trace it through John, just a few texts. Chapter two, verse 11, the turning of water into wine. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. Mm. Now it looks just like power that's, that's being displayed here, but it's love as well. And so we realize that glory is more than just a demonstration of power. Mm -hmm. Chapter eight, verse 50, Jesus says, and I do not seek my own glory. True heavenly glory is not self-seeking. Mm -hmm. There is no selfishness in God's glory. Mm -hmm. Chapter 17, verse 22, Jesus says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Mm -hmm. So here we have this, this understanding of the, of the glory of God that he says, I want to share it. Mm -hmm. I want to give it to, to these people who don't deserve it. Staying in John 17, then verse four and five, I skipped over one, but we're gonna get back to it. I have glorified you on earth. This is Jesus in prayer now. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus declaring that he is united in the glory of the Father and has been for all eternity before creation. The brightness, the majesty of God. But now he's asking to be glorified. Something more to God's glory than just to be ruling and enthroned and creating. What more is there to perfection and glory than simply to be ruling? The glorifying of Jesus, who is already glorious. And John is answering that for us here as he recounts Jesus' prayer. Back to verse 1 of chapter 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that, you, that your son may also glorify you. Jesus will be glorified at an hour a specific time, a particular event that Jesus has been looking forward to, anticipating for his entire ministry and before his, his at the time when he was anointed as Messiah at his baptism. And we can trace that hour all through the book of John, starting there in chapter two, verse four, where Jesus says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. In John 7, 30 and 8, 20, two times where it says they could not lay hands on him to kill him because his hour had not yet come. John 12, 23 and 24, Jesus says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And then he explains by giving the picture of a grain of wheat falling to the ground and dying to produce something more. Chapter 12, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Mm -hmm. Father, glorify your name. And then chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, mm -hmm. that he should that depart from this world, this is uh, the glorifying hour of Christ, the prophetic time from Daniel 9 when the Messiah would be cut off precisely at the right time. So the hour that glorifies the Son is when he takes the sins of, of us upon himself and dies in our place. This is the revelation of the full glory of God. Why couldn't Jesus just come down and show the glory that he had in heaven, the majesty and overwhelming splendor and brightness? How is dying his glory? A couple of reasons. Number one, 
In order to show his glory to humanity, Jesus had to show his glory through humanity. That's good. He had to take who we are upon himself to reveal something that we could not see with our own human eyes. And now, if I'm a good parent, and I do all the things that a good parent does. When push comes to shove, if I'm the parent who, when my, my child is in danger of fire or, or someone chasing them or, or water, whatever it might be, and I don't want to help them because I don't want to dirty my shoes or I don't want to ruin my clothes or, or my car or whatever it might be, then it doesn't matter what I said, what I did. I am not a good parent. The pinnacle of parenthood, the picture of parenthood is risking your life for your child. The glory of the parent is seen in the opportunity to sacrifice. And so God's glory is not glory unless Jesus comes down and becomes one of us to rescue us from sin. That is the full glory of God. When Moses says, show me your glory, God shows him off into the future. I will show you my goodness. I will come down, become one of you, and rescue you out of sin. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Praise Beautiful. the Lord. What an exciting, it's great study. inspiring lesson. We have a moment to share each one of you a final comment. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and He was God. He was the firstborn, preeminent son of God, the unique son. And the only time our creator himself was not created, the only time that he was issued forth or birthed was when he came from Mary's womb. Mm, amen. So the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is one with the word. The word and Jesus are one. And the word comes to enlighten us. It comes to empower us. It comes to balance us. Mm -hmm. Receive the word of God and let him enlighten and let him empower and let him balance you. Amen. John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Every day we're faced with a choice, receive the light and let him transform you. Amen. God's word tells us that we can give glory to God. How can we give God glory? Well, we simply return to him what he already has. We allow him to transform our lives into his loving character and reflect that. And that's how we give glory to God. Amen. 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 The Bible says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I read to you from Desire of Ages, page 530. In Christ is life, mm -hmm. original, unborrowed, mm -hmm. underived. Mm -hmm. He that hath the Son hath life. 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Mm -hmm. Marvelous. Desire of Ages, page 530. You may have seen that we do not always get through all of our notes. And that's why we encourage you to visit 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and there you can uh, set up yourself to get the notes every quarterly, every Sabbath, every week. And so join us next week as we study lesson number four, Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah.